All right, what's happening, guys? I'm here at 2015 San Diego Comic Con, and I have here with me writer director John Schnepp and producer Holly Payne of the film The Death of Superman Lives What Happened. How are you guys doing? Doing good. All right. What's going on? Okay, so well, first off, just to start, uh, can you um, tell me how Comic-Con has been uh, treating you uh, this week? You guys have been here since uh, Wednesday? Oh, you know what? As a, as a goer of Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con since 1997, yeah. I love San Diego Comic-Con. I look forward to it, and we've been going together for many years now. And it's great to just see all our different friends from all around the world, all around the country, all come together to nerd out. I call it the geek mecca, yeah, is yeah, what it is. Out. Yeah. yeah. Sweat it yeah. out, exactly. Sweat yeah. it out. I would so. say that this one has been relentless so far because, uh, you know, we released our film and so the booth has been nonstop. So we haven't seen anything yet, but we're going to make time for that. So. Yeah, and I'd like, to, I'd like to thank every single one of the people who came out here at Comic Con to buy a Blu-ray or a DVD or pre-order the film at www.tboslwh.com. It. Um, I appreciate <laughs> no, but I appreciate everyone who came out and was really excited. A lot of people watching me on Collider Movie Talk and are fans right, of that exactly, show. Exactly. So it's a lot of those people coming out. So I really appreciate all of the support. All of us have worked our ass off on this film, and it's a totally independent movie that we've made ourselves. We're distributing it ourselves. So we need all the help we can get. So tell your friends about it. Okay, there you have it. So. With, with that, uh, no worries. With, with that being said, um, can you talk a bit? It's always interesting to know how uh, how things come together, especially with the fate of a film. You know, you hear all the time that a person was up for a particular part. You know, and up until the film was being made, you know, they were they were a part of that project. Whether it's The Matrix or Back to the Future, uh, what have you. So, can you talk a bit of how you got involved? Uh, how you came across this uh, uh, story? Sure. Well, you know, you touched on something that's very interesting because what happens all the time is people are hired and fired or replaced. Right. And, you know, it happened with Edgar Wright, with Ant-Man. It happens, like, with Thor. It happens all the... It's not just superhero movies. It happens all the time in our business of making entertainment. For every one you hear about, there are a thousand like it. So, yeah. yeah. It's like roaches. Yeah. So, this particular <laughs> movie, for me... The reason I got interested in Superman Lives was basically from the concept art. Some of the art that dropped online, especially from Sylvain Death Pritz, the this, uh, this great artist, concept artist. Um, it just reminded me of like this heavy metal science fiction Superman, which I had never seen before. So I was like, that looks cool. And so then Kevin Smith did his thing, talking about the giant polar bears, I mean, you know, spiders and all that stuff. And then uh, years later, Superman Returns came out, and that was the homage to Richard Donner's Superman that I thought it was a cool idea. I loved the John Williams score. Then I, I saw the movie. I had to wake him up twice, though. I had to wake him up twice in the movie. He was snoring in the theater. Yeah, I just fell asleep. It was like Superman lifting stuff. He lifts a plane. He lifts a car. He lifts a boat. He lifts an island made of kryptonite. Uh, he lifts the Daily Planet. Sir, the, the, I mean, it was like, I mean, literally, we cut it out of our movie, but I had a, a like... Our, one of our editors cut together every scene of Superman lifting, lifting things. Super cut. It was a lifting super cut, which really is amazing because it's so long. It's yeah. like, oh my God, I didn't realize. Like, it's been a long time since I saw that movie, but yeah. He, he doesn't fight it. anyone. He gets kicked around by three dudes and then chucked <laughs> off a mountain after getting shanked by Lex Luthor. It just didn't have the action that nobody wanted, but it was also just in general, just kind of a different interpretation of what the suit, even it was like it had all the Superman, Richard Donner stuff in it, but it was just... It didn't play out the way you would expect a Superman movie. If it was called something different, I think it would have been a great film. But as a Superman movie, it just made me want that weird Superman film that Tim Burton was going to make. After I came out of the theater, I was like, well, at least that was going to have Brainiac. Yeah. At least that had these really cool, bizarre interpretations. I realized that, you know what? As a kid, I grew up with Richard Donner, Superman. I don't ever want to see that again. I want something new. That's one of the reasons I like Man of Steel, the Zack Snyder thing, is it added some new ingredients. It added some new flavor. Say what you will about, you know, you know, Clark Kent reaching out, you know. I think he was like, save me. You know, that's what he was like. Hey, the dog's already escaped. But, you know, I think Clark didn't understand what his dad, you know, just, you know, I'm just saying, I, there's a lot in that movie that's really great. So Superman lives, to me, the artwork is the reason I got interested. Mm -hmm. And for years, I would go online and look for it and search for it and just try to find more about it. Ran into one of the special effects artists, Steve Johnson. Hung out with Holly that night with a bunch of our friends. Talked about it. I was like, everyone was like, hey, you sound really into You're making it sound interesting. Why don't you make a documentary? I was like, nah, I'm I direct cartoons. That's what I do. Right, right, right. Um, and then they were like, why don't you do it on Kickstarter? Because I just made it, uh, I raised money, like 175 grand to make a cartoon the year before. They were like, why don't you do that? I was like, nah. And then like two months later, I remember telling her, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to make this thing. And uh, 
We did? I think, well, yeah, what happened was, um, you know, it really didn't leave him alone for a long time. And there were a lot of other projects on his plate. He could have done anything else. But um, because this was just, because I think the enthusiasm of, of the people around us who were curious about it, just sort of seeing their reactions to finding out what John knew already at that point, which was very minimal at, the, at that time. Um, they were intrigued. And so the Kickstarter was really, it was a litmus test to find out how many people were actually interested in this. And it turned out thousands were. So, um, so that's, that's, where, that's where it began. That's where yeah. it launched off from. Yeah, and I think I was, you know, obviously wrong and thinking I can get it done in eight months. I learned the hard way. It's I knew like, that, though. I knew that. I was like, you're, come on. I mean, I used to work in San Francisco at, at this, you know, video coalition place where people worked on a corn documentary for 10 years. So I was like, that's not going to, and I don't mean K-O-R-N, right. I mean corn. Right, just like the but, actual yeah. milling of the corn. <laughs> that was like, the four hours process. Um, but, uh, yeah, for myself, like, I thought, you know, I could timeline it, but I didn't, what I didn't put into into account was like, I have to get permission. I have to actually, it's not like I just hire someone. I had to get Tim Burton to want to be in the film and then I had to interview him. And that was like, that was a a year and a half process even before we even got in contact with him. Another like year, another like six months. It was about six months. It was about six months. But we we had an interview. We had to fly out to England just to meet him. We didn't know we were going to get an interview. So when we got there, we had a pre-interview, I think it was on a Wednesday um, and uh, I got to talking to Tim about, you know, children's illustration, which is a weird thing because he, he lives in a very famous children's illustrator's house in, in England. And so we, we talked about that for a minute, and then John talked to him about horror movies for a minute, and it was like, all right, I'll do this. That's basically how it went down. Yeah. He was like... Burton realized we were a bunch of weird nerds. He was like, all right, I'll talk to you, fuckers. You know, I was like, <laughs> you fucking weirdos. All right, you're my, my brethren. You know what I mean? We, like, so that's how the documentary went down. It's like literally like when I talked to people, they felt more comfortable. Like, even talking to John Peters' lawyer, he was the last person we interviewed. He wasn't even in the film until a month before the movie was done. Holly was like, you've got to get Peters. I was like, no. The reason I didn't want Peters is every single person we talked to was like, man, John Peters did this. or John. There, were, there was a lot of negative connotations and feelings, especially from the artists. Well, that's one of the things, too. I think the reason that you, you didn't want to talk to him, uh, you know, it, was, it had nothing to do with John Peters in reality it was a perception of john peters that he had an issue with because he's an artist and up till that point we were just talking to artists for for the like 80 percent of the people we yeah. talked to were artists and they all had like oh well he, you know he put rick heinrichs in a headlock you know like some of these crazy things that were like you know he was just like i just don't, i don't think i want to talk to this guy and me on the other hand i was like you have to you have to because you can't tell this story without him. He's too key. He's one of the main ingredients, and he was working on it longer than anyone, even Tim Burton. So without his input, you don't have a complete story. Right. And if it's documentary, you have to be able to tell the whole story. So she was like, wouldn't let, leave it alone. So I was like, all right, I'm going to find somebody. I have to find someone. So I, I found a connect to a connect and just straight up called his attorney. And was like, yo, I, I'm Josh, and I'm trying to make this movie. Explaining it to his attorney. <laughs> And as I had his attorney laughing after a little bit, and I was like, "Look, man, I'm not. It's not me. I'm like, I, I, I don't have an opinion on on John Peters one way or the other. I'm willing to talk to him because all these other people. Well, no, I'm just saying, my opinion was constructed by all these other people. Yeah. So I was like, they're saying this stuff about him. Here's this chance for a rebuttal. At first he said no. Then he changed his mind a week later. Said yes. Then we're in his house interviewing him. And after about a half hour, I was like got inside his head talking with him and I totally understood where he was coming from and we vibed and it was like a cool two almost two hour conversation he, fun. he enjoyed the interview too John Peters was a really he was just a really kind of charismatic yeah. uh, you know very old time Hollywood mogul you know you walk into his place you'll see it in the film it's like everything's gilded you know there are like Italian frescoes painted on the walls yeah. every you know pictures of him all over the place yeah. Giant money sprinkled yeah. all over liberally in different areas. It's out, it yeah. is a pimp yeah. pad. And he's really he comes from that old school producer thing where you like you hear about it like a Roger Corman like every ten minutes I want this and this and he comes at it like if I was directing a film for him I'd be like you know what I can do those five things you know he's like look you can do whatever you want but I need these five things in there I'd be like of course that's because you've already made a hundred movies so you have a methodology to your madness and I'll appreciate that because I'm not producing and I'm going to execute it and do this other thing but I'll make sure that's sprinkled in there I get it because that's the way he would produce things he'd be like I need this and this I need that and that he'd be overseeing it yeah, one of the things people don't realize, I, when I was doing a lot of research about John Peters for this, we, we didn't know we were going to get him at first. So 
uh, you know, it was on the fence for a while. So I started going through any sort of footage I could find of him in an interview. And one of the things I found on YouTube was um, the Caddyshack Blu-ray has an interview with John Peters because he produced that film. He is responsible for the gopher in Caddyshack. So he's the guy who, who that film was not coming together and he actually made that happen. Some of his ideas people might think are wild and crazy, but ultimately, you know, he's made blockbuster yeah. films and there's a reason behind that. Right, he gets the entertainment value. He's like, this thing needs this, it needs the gopher holes and we need to see that gopher escaping. And then bring an ILM. Everyone was like, what's wrong with him? And that's the thing everybody remembers from that movie. So he's really good. He's, at that time, especially, he was really good at creating and making these iconic movies. So you get that, and then you get him with Tim, you get him with Kevin Smith, or even Tim Burton. They're coming at it from an artist's perspective or a writer's perspective, and so you get, you understand, like when you see. Kevin Smith talking about all that crazy stuff. All that's true, but then we got it from from John Peters' perspective, why he wanted a polar bear, why he wanted the giant spider. And there's so much, then you're like, oh, I get it, because he's, he's not a comic book fan. It's like, he was like, Superman's like, like, you know, from the streets. He wants, when he says from the streets, he wants kids to relate to it. It's not like, I grew up on the streets, like, I want the kids from the streets right now, the ones who have the Superman tattoo, which is a symbol of strength. I want them to want to watch and empathize and under and be like, to, to not, it's not some dude floating in the sky in a weird blue outfit. It's a badass dude who knows how to fight and I'm going to have him fight some ninjas. I would have changed it to robot ninjas. <laughs> All right. So lastly, uh, I'm going to get a little bit sweaty for, uh, yeah, with yeah. you for a second. Sweat it, Sweat it up. All right. So congratulations with, uh, you, I know you were talking about uh, Collider, uh, Collider earlier. Yeah. You know, uh, you've been doing uh, uh, AMC Movie Talk and uh, now Collider. So are you going to have an opportunity to, you know, to check out some of the things here at Comic-Con? Or will yeah. it, uh, what, what, what are you uh, uh, going to get most sweaty about All right. this week? So obviously you got Batman v Superman, Hall H. I'm gonna try to break into that. I'm gonna leave my booth for, I'm gonna try my best. <laughs> then you got the Fantastic Four panel. I'm gonna be begging Josh Trank to try to scrimp in there. And then you got, and then you got the Star Wars thing tomorrow. So, you know, I, I have a couple of people who might be able to squeeze me under the door. So we'll see what happens. But most likely, I'm going to be at my booth 3915 with this last right here. And we're going to be selling our film. we got the Blu-rays and DVDs. So if this is, I don't know when this is going to air after Comic-Con. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, the, the things for me that I'm going to be sweating out about mostly is on the floor. Because I love every year I come, except for last year, I didn't get a chance to walk the floor. Because we had a booth and I was just locked down. So this year, I love walking the floor and seeing everybody's new things. I do Artist Alley and check out all the artists from the past and all the new artists who've got their new flavor out. I like to see new products. I was, I was like, oh wow, I saw the, you know, they had a Dark Knight Returns, like Batman <laughs> fighting the mutant. What he really wants is the big yellow Snuffleupagus. I want the yellow Snuffleupagus. The uh, special uh, Funko yellow <laughs> Snuffleupagus. I believe it's felted. I don't have no idea. But uh, so, yeah, the yellow Snuffleupagus and the Batman man rainbow suit is the, the I don't know I mean I'm I'm just gonna check it out and see what's brand new I always I love the the feeling of San Diego comic-con not only because it's so giant and crazy I love going to comic book conventions in general because that's my people so it's sort of like that's the whole thing that's why I like doing the heroes show it's like right. I finally get to talk and share with other people about what you know my personal opinions like you should be reading miracle man you know <laughs> little known fact and I'm gonna out you right now John Schnapp because of heroes, John has maybe teared up a couple of times because of the co of the response to people actually reading the comics that he's recommended. Because it means that much, and it, it's it's really cool that you know that that's getting out there. And I'm really proud of you for for wising people up to the magic of comic books. Yeah, no, it means a lot to me because as a, as a true comic book reader, a lot of people don't read comics now, especially like, I love superhero movies. Well, have you ever read this? No, I don't read comics. It blows my mind. I'm like, don't you understand the true synthesis of writing and art is right there? It's Sweaty. Yeah, it's that's Sweaty. the beauty of comic books. If you have to call it a graphic novel so you don't feel like a weirdo, <laughs> I read graphic novels. It's comic books. <laughs> anyway, call it a graphic novel, you know, but just read it. All right. Well, there you have it, real filmers. Yeah, what's Kali want to see? Yeah, what's what's Kali Kali wanna see? Yeah. I'm not going to see shit because I'm going to be stuck fucking at our booth. <laughs> I'm not going to see anything. 
God damn it. Uh, no, you know what? No, I do right. want to see I do want to kind of see the the beefy. They have the Batman suit here, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that I want I want to see that. Right? I want to see that. See the armored Batman. Yeah. Straight out of the Dark Knight Returns. And I also want to see the new figures that Strange Factory has. Our friends Kathy Olivas yeah. and Brant Peters. Yeah. I can't wait big to see that stuff. Them, big pimp in the Strange Factory and go to our website www.tdoslwh.com and get that download or get the Blu-ray or get the DVD and help support true independent filmmakers. All right, there you have it, guys. Holly Payne, John, John Snap. I'll see you soon.